Good evening, everybody. I hope everybody had a blessed day. It was beautiful outside. As David said, all this stuff is on YouTube. And after you take the class, if you want to go on YouTube to hear it again, because I not only took this class once, I took it, I think, 20 times. So it's not a one-time thing. You know, you have to constantly, you know, we should always, always, always be in a position of learning and always be in a position of change. And I know many of us, me included, don't like change. You know, we figure, oh, we're good here, we're okay, we can't move, you know, we don't have to move on. But this class here, it's possess possessing your vessel, it's Elijah House. We pull in the things from all different, you know, avenues, but of course from the Word of God and what the Word of God says and how it blesses you and how it, you know, I'm going to say some tears your heart apart, but then God puts it back together after you deal, deal with what you need to deal with. But let me open up in prayer. So, Father, we thank you, Lord, Father, for the opportunity that you have given us, Lord, with this series, Father, that we can dive in and see what's in our hearts, Father, so that nothing, nothing will block us to go further in you in the name of Jesus Christ. So what I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to start on the topics. I'm not going to teach on all the topics. I'm just going to give you a little bit tidbit of the topics, and then I'm going to go into a little bit of the heart of stone, revisit it at a later date when I can teach it in full. So the topics are heart of stone, inner vows. Now the heart of stone, it's when you're hard and you won't let anything come in. And inner vows, inner vows is, is, can be very complicated. Um, I can give you an example of an inner vow. When I first got separated, I had to tell my mother that I was getting separated. And coming from an Italian background, my uncle was there and my mother was there. And my mother flipped out because she said, how are you going to live? How are you going to live? You can't do this on your own. You can't be by yourself. And I'm standing there looking at her like, why would she say that? And then my uncle said, you have to go live with your mother because you cannot do it on your own. And something rose up in me and I said, I will never let a man do this to me again. Now that's a good vow. I won't let any man hurt me again. But it was a bad vow because even though we think that was a good vow that you're never going to let a man take advantage of you again or whatever the situation is, it blocks the blessings from the Lord coming in. Now, I know this is complicated. I won't get into this more because Easter will get into it even more when she does bitter root judgment. Um, performance orientation. Performance orientation is when you have to always make sure, I could do it, I could do it, oh, let me do it, let me do it, I could do it here. Oh, I, even though you're, you're dying because you're taking on too many things, you want to make sure that you do it because you're performance oriented. It's That's how you get your blessings or how you think you get your blessings. It's by performance orientation that you constantly want to do good. Now, that's not a bad thing but not when it's out of sorts. When it's out of sorts, it's not a blessing. It becomes hard. It becomes, you know, whatever. And then, so where does performance orientation comes from? Well, you have to come to class and find out. So, <laughs> <laughs> so you know, with that, because, you know, uh, performance orientation is like, I, I never heard of that before until I came to the class. And I was serious. I did not take this class one, two, three, four, five times. I took it because the first time they offered it, uh, here, it was 16 weeks the first time they offered it because they did it under a different way. Then when they did it, Peter like narrowed it down and he did it another way. But it's still, it is like six to eight weeks. You can't get out of that. But the beauty about this series is, so let's just say your problem is performance orientation. You can jump in that class. You know, you should go to every single class, but you can jump into that class to see where, where you're at. That's the beauty about this series that I like. Bitter root judgment and expectancies. You know, that comes from, and I can tell you this, if you don't forgive, it goes like this. Unforgiveness, then it, then it, um, it goes to bitter roots, bitter root judgments, expectancy. 
what happens is it keeps building. It keeps building. It doesn't stop at unforgiveness. So you think you just have unforgiveness, but this ugliness that's inside of us keeps growing and growing and growing. And then before you know it, the bitter root judgment, you expect it to happen to you. You do it inadvertently. You don't know, you don't realize it, but you do it inadvertently. So when you don't forgive, it, it just piles up. It keeps going up and up and up and, and, you know, and then you get to the expectancy part. Well, it's just going to happen because of what you have, in, you know, endured with the unforgiveness, it just will come up. Accomplishing forgiveness. Uh, forgiveness is in many, many layers. You could forgive someone uh, one, two, three, four times, but um, again, I'll use me when um, I was married and I had to forgive my ex, I truly went to forgive my ex, but then there was levels of forgiveness because I would think I forgave him here and then all of a sudden God showed me something else and because I was ready then to forgive him where before I wasn't. So then I think, okay, I'm cool now. Now I move on and he shows me something else. So don't take that as a negative. Because God, is, God wants you free. He does not want anything blocking what he has for us. Nothing, nothing. So then the other thing with forgiveness is um, this one day my sister calls me on the phone. This is years ago. And she said, God told me that you have to forgive. And I said, well, you tell him to call me because I forgave. Because I, I, I really, really, really believe, you know, I was like, Lord, I did. I honestly did. So when I hung up, because I was annoyed that, you know, she said that. Because I'm like, but I did. I forgave. Well, as I went before the Lord and I was asking the Lord, forgive yourself. I was like, oh, I didn't think of that. You know, I'm forgiving everybody else and, you know, everything else. But forgive your part in what the situation because when you don't forgive yourself, you inadvertently say, I'm God, it's pride, I know better than you. And when I, I heard that, I was like, oh, oh, I didn't want that. So I started to forgive myself because when you go through something like that, you may think, well, I know I did. Well, if I did this different, would this happen? Or if I did this, would this happen? You know, you, know, you start thinking, well, if I would have, could have, well, you know, would have. You, you can't do, go backwards. You can't. So then that was my next step of forgiving myself. And then the forgiving of, and then God keeps showing you, forgiving family members, forgiving the things that happened, forgiving, you know, friends, all in the situation that you're in. Everybody's an individual. Everybody goes through it differently. So what hurts you may not hurt me, and what hurts me may not hurt you. So you can never, never, never say to anyone, that's ridiculous, because that's not fair, because that hurt that person's heart. So you should be able to minister to them and walk them through forgiveness. Uh, honoring your father and mother. That's a biggie. I minister to many people, you know, and just remember one thing. Our fathers and mothers loved us dearly, and they did the best they could. They did with what they knew what to do. Some of it was maybe, was abusive. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about, you know, if they didn't say things right or if they called you stupid or if they said negative things. They still loved you. They shouldn't be saying that. But you have to honor them. The Bible doesn't say only honor them in good. You have to honor them even in the negative. Now, there are boundaries too. If their parents are abusive, you have to draw the boundary. And you, you, know, you still talk to them, but there's a boundary. As you get healthy, you will know how to handle that parent, however the situation may be. That's honoring your mother and father. Like, I, I, I know people who, nope, nope, not going to do it. Nope, nope. Do you know what she said to me? The mother. <laughs> and I'm like, no, I don't know what she said, but the, I'm telling you what the Bible says. I'm telling you what we have to do. I'm telling you that. And you have to bring them around. And you have to do it. You have to honor them. You know, I, they did bring us on earth. They did bring us through. So you have to honor them. I would always say to my kids, because it wasn't a good situation. You have to honor your father just because he's your father. And you have to respect them for that.
the rest you ha he has to earn. But my point was never disrespect him, you know, but I didn't want him to, to abuse him either. But, you know, with that, and I would always say that to them, you always have to honor and respect that parent. Basic trust. Basic trust comes in. You don't trust anybody. So what happens? If you don't trust here on earth, you can't trust the Heavenly Father. So how, do you, how are you going to go to him with your earthly father is not good, and you, you don't trust your earthly father or trust things that happen, things happened in your life, and you can't go on with it. How are you going to trust him? You're not going to believe. So that's the basic trust. Um, identification of love. It's all different identification. I, this identification of love, I think of it this way. Everything relates to one another, all these topics. And one of the topics of the heart of stone, you have a hard heart. It affects your identification. And today, what is going on in the world with the identification, with gender identification? They're confused. They don't know what love is. I saw an interview. If anybody could get it, you should watch it. It was by Candace Owen. And it was, was a transgender, I hope I say it right, whatever. He was in, yeah, he, was into, he transitioned into a woman. So at the age of 15, he, they started the process in him. And he kept saying to Candace, I just wanted to feel good. I just wanted to know who I was. And that's what he kept saying. I'm not going through the whole interview, but the purpose of the, of the interview was to tell the people what he did. He knows he did wrong, and there's no going back because he had the operation. And then plus the doctor messed him up. But my point is, so if he didn't know who he was, and there was no identification of love coming out in on the areas, why are the people so confused today? You know, he, she, them, I'm it, I'm that. I'm like, ah. I, I get so confused with all of that alone. They, they don't know who they are. And we need to, as, as Christians, we need to be pouring out the love. I'm going to go on a rabbit trail here. I, um, I'm, I'm a, I was an ex-Catholic. And um, Catholics are good people, so please. Um, yeah, they're good people. There are many Catholics who have a relationship with the Lord. They do. Um, but uh, what I noticed, if you have noticed, they, they did this app. It's called Hallow App. And the Hallow App is for praying. And I thought, wow, look what they're doing. People are hungry to hear the word of God. But the thing is, so I'm, I've been following it because I want to see what they say. They're giving wrong teachings. They're not teaching the right way. They're not teaching what you really should be praying. So I get on and I just type. Nobody answers me because I think they're ignoring me. I go, no, that's not what happened. It happened here, you know. I, and I just tell them what's going on. I'm respectful, but I go, no, 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 no. Go here, go there, and I just tell them. People are hungry for the word of God. And we need to be alert. We need to be discerning on what's going on around us so that we can help the people and lead them to the Lord. You know, and know that God is the one who's doing everything, but... We are the conduits of Jesus Christ. And if we're the conduits of Jesus Christ, we should be doing this all the time. Um, i tell you this story. Sunday, we were at a diner. And um, Renee prayed with the waitress. Sam and I were sitting at another table. They left. The woman comes over. The waitress comes over to us. And we prayed for her. And she said, how do you know those people over there? I said, we all go to church together. I could, I could see it. I could feel it. So they, they're sensing God. They are sensing God. So she got a double whammy. And Renee prayed. I prayed. Sam prayed. We all prayed, you know, and stuff. But that's what they're, they're, they're it's just, I have never seen it so, you know, like where they just come out and say things like that, you know. So that's where we have to be ready to, to really talk to them and not talk religion, talk the love of God, talk about how much God loves us and what God can do for us. The last one is uh, parental inversion. Now that's when um, you have a child and a mother who, uh, or a father, whomever, who the child takes on the parent role and their parenting 
the uh, parents because it could be either could be a single parent situation, could be where the mother and father are just sick. It could be many different things. Could be where the household has many children. So the oldest child always takes on, you know, the, oh, we'll get so-and-so to help out here. The oldest child always does, you know, the, the with parent. That is not of God. Children should not be parenting their parents. It should be the other way around. And especially parents should not be talking to their children about adult things. Like, they don't need to know anything. They don't. And I, I can say when I went through my stuff, I never told my kids anything. They would ask me a question. I would surface answer it. Because they didn't know to need to know details. They didn't need to know anything. But then I must say, people outside of my house, you know, thought they need to tell them. And they would come back to me and I'd be like, oh my God. But you know, you don't need to be telling them things that they don't understand. Right. You don't, you don't need to be pressuring them because there's a saying, children are great observers, but lousy interpreters. So they observe things, you know, um, well, I, I saw my parents arguing, so they got divorced because of me, because I wasn't good. I, I misbehaved. So they're observing, but their interpretation of what is going on is wrong. So that's why we have to be really, really careful with that. So those are the topics. I'm really excited about it. I know the leadership is excited, and anybody who is breathing should be taking this class. I'm serious. I mean, it's really, really rich in what we're, you know, is taught. And it really, really helps us too, because we don't realize what's in our lives. Like, we don't intentionally say, well, I'm going to hold bitterness, and that's it. You know, we don't do that. You know, when we get hurt, it, every individual, as I said before, is different. And every individual is going to deal with things differently. So there's not a pattern. There's not a formula, rather, I should say. There's not a formula and say, some things you can see a pattern. If you see a pattern going on, you can pick up on things. But there's no formula to anything. The person has to dive into the word of God. And I'm going to say this. God will heal you. But there are times when you need additional help. You might need professional counseling. There's nothing wrong with that. But as long as you go do it for that time being, don't make it, you know, and get what you need, and then come back. But in, while you're doing it, you're in the word, you're in the word, you're in the word, because that's how God frees us of things. Because I'm sorry, there are counselors out there don't know what the word of God says. And if you do go to counseling, Please make it be a Christian counselor. But, you know, with that. So if you are going to a counselor, there's no shame in it. There's no shame in it. Just get what you need and go on before the Lord and let the Lord show you stuff. So with that said there, I'm going to go on a little bit of a teaching of the heart of stone. Now, the heart of stone, you see the heart. It's all rough. That's because all those things there, I'm going to say, there's rejection, there's abandonment, there's hurt, there's, there's um, rebellion, there's disobedience. All that is in the heart. And you hold on to that heart and you hold on to it. So what happens with it, you get a heart of stone. And you're very hard. You ever like talk to people and they're so cold, you're like, ugh. You know, like they're, they, they're really, really cold. Because they, that person has been hurt. And instead of releasing it, they held on to it. And when they held on to it, their heart is stone. They, they won't move. So let me go on. So I didn't give you this, Rayo, so don't worry. So Psalms 95a says, do not harden your heart. The Lord says it in the Bible. We are not to harden our hearts. Hardness of heart in the Bible is a heart that is like stone and that is unmoved, unfeeling, unresponsive. Sometimes to human suffering, but worst of all, unmoved, unresponsive, unfeeling towards God's word and God's mercy, God's gospel offers. What is a heart of stone? An automatic hidden, it automatically hiddens and the defense mechanism, which keeps from being vulnerable or seen. So you, it's a mechanism that hides you. It's a mechanism that keeps you from seeing, being seen. You could be isolated and you don't move on, but you're good. You're good. Oh, I'm good. I'm good. And, you know, you, you move on like that. 
So then you go on to how is a heart of uh, stone formed? Um, the earliest, you, I, I was like, wow. Uh, let me just read it. Out of our earliest experience of frustration and dissatisfaction, out of Adamic nature, we respond sinfully. A baby lies in a crib crying for food or attention, but mother responds by changing a diaper. Baby can't speak, can't pray, frustration grows. I would never think that a baby would get this at that age. This is from under six years old. A baby wakes up in the night and cries, waking parent. Parent responds to the child need with anger. The child begins to build a wall of protection around the heart because the mother gets up during the night. She probably was up three, four times. She gets up, she's, you know, and the baby can sense it. Baby can sense something's wrong. It starts forming in the heart of a child. And I was like, wow. Um, then we go on. I'm just giving you little tidbits here because in a couple of weeks it's going to come back on and I'll go really into depth with it. Now you need to recognize the, the problem. In some cases, the condition is obvious, characterized by heartless, uncaring behaviors and selfishness. So some of it you can see, you know, a person's really cold and not, no move. And some of it you can't because people hide it so much that you, you don't know that they're, they're, you know, hurting the way they are. Impact of a heart of stone. In families, it's refuse love and intimacy. Person's cold, they can't give intimacy, they can't love, they can't, they have a hard time with it. Um, in relationship, the gifts of others, puts, they put them down. No matter what they have, everybody has a gift, but they put them down. They can't just like accept whatever they're doing. Um, in leaders in the church, it destroys the church. If the leaders have a heart of stone, it can destroy the church. Because if the leaders are hard and they're not showing the love of God, how are we going to, how are the people supposed to respond, you know, with that? That's another way. Um, This here, the heart of the stone is formed as protection. It protects you too, because you don't want anybody to hurt you. So you'll just like, okay, you stay there. I, I'll, you'll step in just so far and you won't go further. So the Bible tells us there is safety in multitude of counsel in Proverbs 24, 6. But those with hearts, with hearts of stone have difficulty availing themselves in this protection. They... They can't do it. So they're going to isolate. They're not going to tell you things. They're going to keep quiet. Je I like this one. It's between me and God. Just between me and God. Now, I'm not making fun of it. That's sad. That's sad. Yes, it is between you and God. And yes, you need to, to, to reach out to God. But that's why we have the brothers and sisters in Christ to talk to one another. We are all pieces to the puzzle. And we're all here to help one another and love one another and minister to one another. So when they say that, that's red flag, red flag. It's like, eh, eh, eh. okay, when they say that right away. So you have to, like, be able to talk to them to get them all, okay, yes, it is between you and God. But let's talk about this. Let's see this. Let's, you know, you know whatever. To gingerly get them into it, you know, with that. Um, there is healing. And the healing is uh, confession, forgiveness, and prayer. There is healing. So when you identify what the thing is in your heart and what hurt you, you go before the Lord and you confess it. You ask for forgiveness for holding on to it. And you pray. And God will release it. And when the beauty about it is, I know for me and I, I know many other people, when you're praying, God will reveal to you whatever else is there. Now, don't think because God's revealing to you things like, oh, my God, I'm really, I have so much or, you know, what? no, no. Again, I say it, everybody's an individual. Everybody has gone through things differently. No one, two people have gone through the same thing. So it may be similar, but not the same thing. So if it happens over and over again, you have to keep going before the Lord. And sometimes you may have a hard time forgiving that person or that thing or that situation because of what it did to you and how it hurt you. 
So you keep going back. And what the, the beauty about it is God doesn't go, okay, that's enough. You're done. He doesn't do that because if he did, we're in trouble. So um, Matthew 13, 15 says, for the hearts of these people are hardened and their ears cannot hear and they have closed their eyes. So their eyes cannot see, their ears cannot hear and their hearts cannot understand and they cannot turn to me and let me heal them. So that's what happens. You get so hard, you cannot hear from God. You, you can't because you have blocked the ways. You blocked it uh, with it, and, and that's what you don't want to do. Ezekiel 36, 26 through 7 says, this is a beautiful statement of the new covenant, covenant that Jesus fulfills when he sheds his blood for sinners. I will give you a new heart, a new spirit. I will put within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh that is a tender heart that can feel, can be a, a touch. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and, and be careful to obey my rules. He loves us so much. He, this is what he said he's going to do for us, and he's not a liar. He's going to do it for us if we allow him to do it. So he, the Hebrew culture, one of the things it says, the heart of stone means that it's the core of one's being lifeless. So here are some of the spiritual symptoms of a heart, of a hardened heart. Unable to perceive, unable to understand, unable to see, unable to hear, unable to remember. Those are characteristics, spiritual characteristics that if you ever tried to explain something to them in the word and people just don't understand it, that possibly could be because their heart is so hard. This one here I've encountered many times, unable to remember. So when you're ministering to the people and you're talking to them and, and uh, you know, um, I, I call it the interview. So, okay, how was your childhood? How is, you know, did you get along with your father? Did you get along with your mother or whatever? I don't remember. Or they'll go, oh, it was really good. When you know for a fact it was not. Okay. I know two people, a brother and sister, who the sister said it all, said what was wrong, and the brother said, well, I had loving parents. Well, I asked him, did you grow up in the same household? You know, I mean, he gave one story, she gave another story. And the story was, she was telling the truth, he was in denial, you know, so, you know, he, he just didn't, he, he had a heart of stone, he had a heart of stone, and, and there was no getting, you know, chiseling the heart, because he didn't believe it, um, Mark 8, 17 to 18, and Jesus, aware of this, said to them, why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Do you not perceive or understand? Are you hardened, uh, heart hardened? Having eyes, do you not see? And having um, ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember? Now that was when he was, you know, given the bread, doing all that, and the disciples were concerned there was only one bread. And that's how Jesus responded to him. Aren't, aren't you spiritually understanding what I'm doing? But if you have all these issues in you, you won't understand it. You won't understand what he's doing, and you know, you'll, your thought process will be so different. Um, you, all you have to do is ask the Lord uh, to help you to have a softened heart. Lord, show me my heart. Show me. Show it to me. I don't want it to be, you know, the way it is. I want to be soft. I want to be, you know, uh, being able to, to be, talk to people. Now, I, I also know somebody who, um, he had a, a, a physical, oh, sorry, a physical heart issue. And he was in the hospital. And what happened was he told the Lord, um, I'm ready to go. Okay, you could take me. And he was young. And the Lord said, no, I'm not taking you. Because of the terrible things that he had gone through, and he just figured, I can't take my heart. The Lord told him, I'll, I will give you. He said to him, I'll give you a new heart, and he did. This person oozes with love now, oozes with love. And you just want to be around them because when he talks to you, it's like, wow, you know, 
but that is a true story. He really, his heart really, really, you know, failing him because he, he had so much pain of what had happened to him. So why do you think people have symptoms? Now, please don't go away from here saying everybody has a heart issue, has a hard heart. But, uh, you know, but why do you think people have symptoms like that? Because of the stuff that's in them, the stuff that they're not releasing. Because if we go to the Bible, nowhere in the Bible does it say, well, God said that if this happens, you have diabetes. If this happens, you have heart failure. He never said that. He talks about healing. He talks about blessings. He talks about living life. He talks about all these different things. So... I'm sorry, don't tell me that it's God's will for us to be sick because it is not God's will. But we are here, so what are we doing to our bodies? Our bodies are temples of the Holy Ghost. It's a temple of God. So if we're mistreating our bodies, what do you think is going to happen? You can't blame God for that. You can't blame God. I'm just using diabetes. Like, you have diabetes and you're going to Dunkin' Donuts and you keep having, you know, your bl blood sugar problems. Well, whose fault is that? You can't say that's God. Or if you're an alcoholic and you're going to the liquor store to buy liquor all the time, whose fault is it? Is it? We have to take responsibility. Because the one thing that God won't do, he won't go against our will. Because if he goes against our will, that's what the witches do. The witches go against your will to try to grab your will where Jesus Christ will not do that. Will not do that. Will not go against our will. He's not happy with the way we choose things, but he won't go against our will because that's what he, he did to, in the Bible. I forget where, but anyway, he did it. <laughs> so he did it. <laughs> um, Psalms 51.10. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. I know for me, I ask all the time, Lord, show me. You know, when there is a conflict, I've learned to do this for me. What's my part in it? What's my part in it? And, pro and most of the times, it's never me. But anyway, so, you know. <laughs> but, you know, what's my part in it? <laughs> yeah. You have to because it could be something that, you know, you misunderstood or, you know, whatever. So it can, it's not always one-sided. You know, there's two people when they have the argument. The person doesn't have the argument by himself or herself. They have the argument, you know, whatever. So I've learned to always, what's my part in this, Lord? Show me. And, and if my part is I did something wrong. Okay, show me what I can do or what I can say. Of course, apologize, but what I can do to make it right. You know, that's humbling, you know, with that. You know, you, you, nobody gets up in the morning and they say, I think I'm going to hurt Linda today. They don't do that. You know, they don't do that. <laughs> nobody does that, you know, unless you're really a mean person. But nobody does that. Nobody gets up and say, I'm going to hurt someone today. It happens. It happens, you know. Um, there you go. A person with a hardened heart does not recognize spiritual, um, spiritual realities around him or her. A hardened heart person cannot see the way God is working in their situation, even uh, through close family and friends. Family and friends are telling you God's here, God's doing it. They can't see it. They can't see it because they're so close. Now, characteristics of a hard heart, rebellion and disobedience. So this one time, my daughter was young, and my sister Trisha, we were talking. I don't know what Christina did. She did something. So Trisha goes, you know, in the Old Testament, they used to stone them. I said, what do you want me to do? I, know, I said to her, so what do you want me to do, go out and stone her right now? You know, you know, with that. But <laughs> thank God we don't do that anymore. They used to stone them. But, you know, I'm like. You know, so yeah, we know she was in rebellion, but what am I supposed to do? So anyway, with that, so it's rebellion and disobedient, and thank you, Jesus, we don't stone people anymore. So the rebellion there. Ezekiel eleven nineteen, and I will give them one heart and a new spirit. I will put within them. I will remove the heart of stone from their flesh and give them a new heart of flesh. He, you know, the Lord says it several times in the word. So if he says it several times in the word, he's trying to tell us something. 
again, I'm reading Ezekiel 36, 26. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit. I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from the flesh and give you a heart of, of flesh. He wants our heart clean. He wants our heart pure. It's, it, what is it in Psalms 24? Give us a, a pure heart and clean hands. Well, you can't have a pure heart if you're not going to get rid of all the junk that's in your heart. It won't happen. It won't happen. So in Psalms, um, I'm sorry, I have to put you down again. <laughs> um, what is the condition of your heart? Just ask the Lord, what's my condition? What's the condition of my heart? Do you need a heart transplant? Anybody here needs a heart transplant tonight? You know, like, really. Psalms 139, 23 and 24. This is the scripture that I learned very early on in my um, Christianity, and I would use this and put my name in it. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there is any grievous uh, way in me, and lead me in the way of everlasting. And I use that all the time. And some of the versions say, show me my hurts, or some of it says, show me my wicked ways. It just means hurts and, you know, whatever. So we should be in that position of constantly asking about, um, search my heart, Lord. Please search my heart. Show me what what um, is in me so I can be more like you, so I can do it. So when we have junk in us, whether it's, performance orientation, not honoring your mother and father, basic trust, um, the, other, oh, the other things. Here it is. So you have, so I want you to picture this. So if you take, this is basic trust, that box is heart of stone, that's inner vows. Over there is performance orientation. So they're there. And God is on the other end. You're over here praying. He's trying to get through. Basic trust, performance orientation, heart of stone, you know, uh, rejection or whatever. He can't get through. All this stuff is in front of us that he can't get through. And he desperately wants to get through. He doesn't just want us to not, you know, let it get through. He wants us to be healed 100%. Now, I say this. I've been taking the class over and over again, and I love it. I love it, I love it, I love it, because every time I take it, and every time, like even I was doing inner vows, but Easter's going to do inner vows, <laughs> I'm studying the inner vows, and I went, oh, God, let me see, did I make any inner vows here? And I started going back to it, because you forget, you know, you, you know, whatever, and I just asked, oh, well, let me see here, oh, you know, and then what happens about this now, when you encounter something, whatever topic it may be, when you encounter something, you don't have to be paralyzed. You can go home in your prayer closet and you can say, okay, Lord, right now I'm dealing with a heart of stone and I feel blah, blah, blah. Can you show me where it came in, where it entered in, and can you help me? I repent, I forgive, I, you know, you confess it, repent, forgive, and you go through it. That's how simple it is. Now, if you do it and you still got like a ugh inside of you, then you call somebody, help me, help me get through this. Now, um, I went through this just a couple of weeks ago where I've been divorced 40-some years. <laughs> I'm just thinking, ugh, anyway, you know, with this. And I was um, in the presence of these people. I've been in their presence a gazillion times, understand this, and I was fine. Well, this day I leave, and I'm like, yeah, well, because of you, because of me, you're here, and because of this, you know, I'm just fighting with myself, and because of this, you know. Now, I go home, and I said, well, do I need to forgive them again? So I went before the Lord, and I said, you know, I started to forgive, but it didn't go away this time. So now, it didn't go away that I'm in tears. I mean, I'm like, I, it's, you know, that, that ugly cry where you, <laughs> it was like this. I'm like, what in the world? Well, I had called Christine. I said, okay, you got to walk me through this. You know, I don't know what it is. Well, it was trauma that was left in me that I didn't know. 
But I'm saying to you, if I didn't have all these teachings here and I didn't know, I would just think, what's wrong with me? How come this? How come that? Now, why did it come up after all these years? Probably maybe, you know, I can honestly say maybe God was trying to show me early on, but I wasn't ready to receive it. Or maybe I was just ready to receive it now. I don't know. I don't care why it came out. All I know is it came out. <laughs> so, you know, it's gone. And that's the beauty of this. So you know how to go back and you know how to say to God, help me, show me. And he does. He's so faithful. He's so faithful in it that he will show you. He won't just leave you hanging. And I've done it over and over again. And many times it was me forgiving. Okay, I have to forgive, blah, blah, blah. And I go ahead and I forgive. I'm cool. I'm cool. But this time, I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. So that's why we need the body of Christ. That's when you pick up the phone and you call whomever. Now, don't just call any Tom, Dick, and Harry. you got to call somebody who knows what they're doing. So you call them and say, this is what I'm dealing with. You know, blah, blah, blah. And you go on like that. But the Bible is a Bible of solutions. It's not a Bible of, oh, well, sorry, I didn't see that coming. So, you, you know, you just have to deal with it. In the Bible, everybody, David, look at everybody who went through stuff. Joseph, look at it all. The, Jesus didn't promise a gold, rose garden in the Bible. It's not all peaches and cream. Not all peaches and cream at all. Every person that I read They've gone through stuff, but they dealt with their stuff. They did, you know, David, when he did Bathsheba, when, you know, Joseph, when he, you know, even though he was right, he was in jail, he, he did what he had to do. You know, I'm just, I can't think of all of them right now, but I mean, they all had their issues. So if they had their issues, I don't mean you in general, but what makes you think that you, we're not going to have issues. In life, we all are going to have issues. In life, we go through it at work. So how, and even at work, it's like, I know how to deal with it. I know how to, you know, instead of reacting, I can respond to sometimes when they, they're negative. And sometimes, you ever hear that? Silence is golden. Sometimes you just need to be silent and just walk away and let God deal with it. And then there are times where God doesn't want you to be a doormat either. Sometimes you need to speak up and say what you have to say. But I'm, I'm telling you, with the teachings here, I worked in corporate you know, all my adult life. And, and this is, I learned how to talk to these people because I always worked with the CIOs and all those people who a lot of times they think they know who they are. They're very nice people, though. But anyway, you know, you know I mean, it, and you have to, like, okay, talk to them. Let them understand, you know, and, and all that. And... That's what I have to say here. So be excited about all these topics that are coming. And if you can be in person, wonderful. Be in person. And, of course, online people, you can stay online. But there's nothing like being in person. Nothing like being in person and getting the word. So I hope this blessed you. Get excited. Look at the titles. Start to thinking about Heart of Stone because we're going to come back to that in a couple of weeks. And we'll go more in depth. Start thinking about it. Start thinking, do I have a Heart of Stone? And then when we get to it, we'll do the prayer. We'll break, the, we'll break it. The, you know, if there's a prayer out there that you could read now if you want. But we'll break it. And each session... We are going to pray for people. In each session, we're going to break things. So get ready for this and get ready that, you know, to be free, to be free and be free. Because this house has gone to a new level. And this house is going even to a higher level. And in order for us to go into a higher level, we don't want all those things in front of it so God can't get through. We want to be clear and God can get through to us and do what he wants. Because remember, we're the conduits of him. And we're about to have an explosion here. It's already exploding, but if you think that's exploding, watch, wait till you see what's happening now. So I bless each and one of you and thank you. And I just pray. So Father, I thank you, Lord, for tonight. I thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you, and Father, each person here, Father, that the word that went through, let it minister to the hearts and let them think and let them cry out to you, Lord God, to see if there is anything within them that they need to deal with. And we know that you are a God of solution and you will help each and every one of them in the name of Jesus. Amen.